Okay. I'll be admitting people here along the way. So if you see my eyes kind of going over to the right of the screen. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, my name is, uh, sorry, uh, my name is Tyler Stallings. I'm the director at the Doyle Arts Pavilion at Orange Coast College. Um, today's Zoom panel, Creativity During Crisis, How Has the Pandemic Transformed Curatorial and Art Practices? Um, and, uh, and again, other than the presenters, if you, everybody can mute themselves and uh, feel free to disengage your video feature. Um, the Zoom panel is being recorded and we'll make it available um, at a later date. Uh, so today's uh, panel, it rose out of a conversation with Los Angeles artist Rebecca Campbell. And uh, she and I have been planning um, a solo exhibition of her work, um, which was scheduled for last fall, um, 2020, uh, but it's been postponed several times um, uh, due to the uh, pandemic. And now it's scheduled to open in spring uh, 2022, uh, which hopefully seems like a safe bet. Um, and uh, as we talked, and I'm um, looking back to the past year, recognizing the challenges of the pandemic and the civil unrest, um, you know, the move to online programming, um, I know for myself, has presented a lot of opportunities um, for, and also for artists, curators, students, faculty, um, and the broader community to kind of consider new ways to connect um, to the visual arts. And following on this, um, um, as Rebecca and I spoke, um, she proposed doing a roundtable discussion uh, among artists and curators who reflect back on this past year and can also consider what lay ahead. Um, so she and I brainstormed and we came up with today's um, a great um, list of panelists. Um, and the structure for today will be each person um, is going to talk for about eight minutes. Um, each person will be introduced right before um, their presentation. Um, and then um, at the end, we'll engage in conversation. And along the way, please use the chat feature um, to um, pose any questions that if time allows, I'll pose them during the presentation or we'll wait at the end of the, all the presentations. Um, so today's uh, panelists include Rebecca Campbell, um, Chris Christian, Samantha Fields, Kim Garrison, and Jill Moniz. Um, so first I'm gonna introduce Rebecca Campbell and then she'll introduce Jill um, thereafter. So again, thank you all for be, being uh, here today. And again, for those just joining us, if you could uh, mute your microphone, please. Uh, so, um, in introducing Rebecca, um, Rebecca, she's been, uh, for nearly two decades, has been creating um, outsized paintings, often encompassing a field's, uh, a viewer's field of vision, uh, featuring figures in a dreamlike, allegorical setting, um, exploring gender politics, dogmas, nuanced interpersonal, familial relationships. Um, she fuses abstraction and figuration, um, often imbuing her epic paintings with a vibrating luminosity. Um, her works are um, in dialogue with painters um, through the ages that include John Singer Sargent, Edward Monet, Pablo Picasso, Willem de Kooning, and Anish Kapoor, just to name a few. Um, and then she often um, incorporates these references with the use of family photographs as a source material for her paintings. Um, and she received her MFA from, the, from UCLA. Uh, she's currently a professor in the art department of California State University Fullerton. And she'll have an upcoming solo exhibition at L.A. Louver Gallery um, in Los Angeles that opens on May 24th. Um, so with no further ado, Rebecca Campbell. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so thanks, everybody, for coming. And thank you to the panelists for coming. I've missed seeing your faces. And um, I'm happy to have this discussion because I'm, I'm curious what's been going on with everyone. Um, I am going to uh, screen share here, if I can do that. Uh, so if I do this, you guys will go straight to my PowerPoint, right? Is that the way it works? Sure. Yeah. Screen share. Uh, desktop. And I'll start here. So for me, um, it made most sense to talk about this in a kind of chronological way. So I'm starting here with some images of what I was doing right before the pandemic hit. That was a pretty academic uh, kind of exercise that I was doing based uh, on uh, events that came from the 2016 presidential election. Sorry, there we go, oops. So in February, in the beginning of March 2020, uh, I'm in the studio beginning this very large painting. It's 88 inches by 109 inches. And you can see the very first sketch here. Sorry, my... Uh, 
I'm just beginning it. I'm filling in the figures slowly. There's 33 figures. Every time, sorry, I hit this, it's doing something weird. You can see the scale of the image here. March 14th, 2020, LAUSD announces a two week school closure due to the global pandemic and my own teaching at Fullerton moves completely online. My kids start to play a lot in the garden. Uh, we plant some vegetables as we do every spring, but more seriously because there are shortages at all of the stores, uh, we can't find garlic or flour. And I cook a lot to try and avoid panicking, honestly. You'll see in this presentation, there's pretty much absolutely no line between my professional practice and my personal life. On April 3rd, 2020, I uh, have been feeling sick and in pain for about 11 days. One of my doctors tells me to avoid the hospital and to drink mint tea. The other tells me to take Norco. April 4th, 2020, I'm admitted to Cedar sinai for a perforated appendix and a serious infection. April 10th, five days later, I'm released and told by my surgeon to go home and finish my antibiotics, but they can't remove my appendix while an infection is present. When the infection is gone, the operation, unfortunately, will be considered elective surgery, which they are not performing because of the pandemic. I go home, recover for four weeks. I do laps around my yard every single day, 10, 15, then 20, 30, 50. This rosebud is a tiny bud when I get home. I pass it on every lap around the yard, and by the end of April, it looks like this. I can't work on my own art, so I help the kids work on theirs. I finally make a drawing of Rory when I'm feeling better, and I also make it into the yard for a couple of hours to make a tiny painting of the garden. When I focus on the things that are growing, I feel stronger and healthier myself. In May 2020, my online teaching wraps up and I feel very lucky to be able to spend time with my kids. I usually work full time through the summer. I cook a lot because that's how I show love, but I also cook a lot because it keeps me from panicking in this situation. I start to think a lot about panic and how people end up there. Oops. May 25th, 2020, George Floyd is murdered by the police and protests against racial injustice are ignited across the US and the world. They continue to this day. In June, I start feeling strong enough to go back into the studio. This painting all of a sudden is most definitely not about what I thought it was about. Oops, sorry. Um, all the girls are white except for one Native American girl at the edge of the composition. I begin to think more deeply about how much my perspective and experience of feminism is really of white feminism, and the painting becomes about the girl in the corner. I start thinking about my family history with the racist Mormon -like Lamanite program, placement program, and how a 16-year-old girl named Lena, whose family lived on the Navajo reservation, lived in our home for over a year. She was sad most of the time and eventually ran away, and it uh, made me think and wish I knew the story of the girl in this photo. I make new studies for this painting, applying four different patterns, including tartan, uh, Shoshone, and Navajo patterns, and a 60s floral print. I prepare the dresses with the white ground to paint the floral pattern over. I become unexpectedly struck with the dazzling yet suffocating quality of the white marks heaped on without the filter of rendering. In my research of the Shoshone Nation, I begin to understand how attributing land to any one tribe is wrong-headed in terms of how tribes inhabit space, so I make a study about how people overlap. I start researching to find the name and history of the girl in the photo. I start painting a Navajo painting, a Navajo pattern on her dress, assuming she is part of the Lamanite placement program. And I think at one point I found her through an alumni group. What I discovered was much more complicated. She thought the photo looked just like her, but she couldn't remember having been in the photo. She loved her time at BYU and she's now the wife of a Mormon bishop. I discovered I will never know the story of the girl in the photo and her story is not mine to tell. My story is of the sea of white. Some of them pretending to be asleep, some pretending to hold each other, many of them drowning in their radiant white dresses. 
The fact that the girl clings to the edge of the composition with the aperture of the painting set to allow her disappearance is something I think about a lot. The garden continues to be miraculously productive and gives me lots of joy. I still cook a lot to try and avoid panicking. A lot. I paint what we are growing and eating. The paintings are small because that's what I can physically handle at the moment and because I'm working from home because my children are home. I also paint what we're drinking. August 2020, 97% of the Big Basin State Park is ravaged by wildfire. You see my children there on the left years ago and the current state. During the same time period, roughly a million acres of forest burned in Oregon, the second worst season on record. And the sky all of a sudden looks like Tatooine and my children are scared. I think you can see in this photo. In trying to keep my shit together for my kids while this world seems to be burning down, I start focusing on beauty and strength. I need to remember how to find the sublime in the chaos. I look for it in nature. I start making paintings from our last trip to Oregon and the Olympic Peninsula. I start to write and sketch things around the house almost every day. I need to write every day, bad things, dumb things, things that don't need to be said, because if I write things down, they will last forever and I will never die. None of us will ever die because we will be swimming in the amber of a useless act that crushes time into the glitter of Christmas villages and the Portland of your waxy pistachio body, young as a fresh scab. Write it all down. It does not matter at all. You do not matter, but we do not matter together. And when we can see each other, get a glimpse through what we write or make or show of the connection, it makes everything okay. Everything is okay. Write it down, paint it, play it, fuck it. We say it means something, so it fucking means something. We do not matter, but we are beautiful. You are beautiful. I love you, and so I'm going to write myself down to try to reach out and find you in all this apocalypse. October 20th, 2020, I'm readmitted to Cedar sinai for a perforated appendix and infection. Home two days later with my appendix removed. Recovery seems hard but feasible. November 2020, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris win the 2020 election. Recovery seems hard but feasible. Rebecca, eight minutes. Thanks. so. Oh, I gotta go faster. <laughs> December 2021, we celebrate the solstice in Joshua Tree. It's the first time we've left the neighborhood since March. Our whole family gets COVID. My husband, Todd, gets very sick. Gratefully, he is never hospitalized. I cook a lot to avoid panicking. I stop going to the studio to take care of Todd and the kids, so we work on their projects. There's a coup attempt on January 6th and a mob attacks the US Capitol building. January 20th, the coup attempt fails. Beautiful things are said, difficult things are promised, and recovery seems hard but feasible. I start painting at home again. I make it back into the studio. I need more room for these paintings, so I get bigger canvases. And this is the last painting I made. And I wanna read really quickly something about this painting. As a girl, I refused to use the word, words cute, nice, or love. There was no excuse for letting these bimbo words pollute my mouth or brain. I also refused to learn to sew or knit or bake. I stood sullenly in the outer ring of the 4-H club circling Marlene Maxfield as she demonstrated with one hand how to crack and release an egg, carefully segregating it into a ramekin before incorporating it into the main mix in case it was filled with rivulets of blood or a scrambled feathered bone instead of a future cupcake. I could not let myself learn this. I bragged a single attempt at brownies resulted in boiling inedible chocolate lava. I also refused the notion I would ever have a child. These tenants of no cooking, no sewing, no ding-dong vocabulary, no children, 
They would keep me safe from reliving the perpetual tragedy of the women who came before me, the women I watched turn to powder under the glance of their husbands, the women I saw hiding under hairspray and aprons from harassment, endless labor, and spiteful abandonment, the women I witnessed drowning in children, so much love leaking out everywhere, a sea of self-sacrifice. If I couldn't cook, I couldn't take care of anyone. If I didn't sew, I would have to chase other skills. If I used only words with squared edges, I could maintain a force field against sentimentality that would thwart any man's attempts to domesticate me. Love is a family name, my grand grandmother's maiden. When I told my mother we were naming our second child in her honor, I expected delight. Instead, she immediately said, you can't. My brothers both had the middle name Love and they were ridiculed their whole lives. Mom, it might help that he's being born in 2009 in Los Angeles, California, instead of 1936 in Rupert, Idaho. Well, do what you want, honey. Another midlife warning. Love is still a weakness. Love, a word so big and looted, we say it, we withhold saying it, we show it with breakfast or apologies or paintings. We lose it in between seasons and sheets and election cycles. It can hover over our gestures, a mirage that disappears on arrival. But love also lives with me. I made him by knitting the spaghetti of my guts with a flooding penis and baking the mess in a special place that used to hold my lungs and intestines. Love grew in me. That is a ding dong thing to say. The kind of thing a soccer mom holding a plate of perfectly baked brownies might say with her brain crocheted shut and her feet sewn together to keep her from running. The drive home from my studio is three songs long. The day I finished this painting, the third song was Nat King Cole's Nature Boy. Flutes, strings and horns, then the custard of his voice stretching and pouring over the story of a boy preaching love. The only path through the studio this year has become love. Holding it, allowing it to hold the images and the brush, allowing it to mat the static of terror and fatigue into a nest in the forest of no one knows and we are all together. Thank you, Rebecca. That was lovely. Um, Welcome. I think love is the word. <laughs> Right. Um, so now next we have uh, Jill Moniz and you're going to introduce Jill. Great. I have that privilege. Jill Moniz is an independent-minded curator of visual narratives. She shares her vision of empowering visual literacy through community engagement with neighborhoods, museums, and galleries worldwide. Her curatorial investigations launched from her project space quotidian and the nonprofit Profit transformative arts support local artists in site-specific installations and exhibitions that create much needed visual language for the greater good. Her noted exhibitions in Los Angeles include Photo Flux, opening at the Getty in May, L.A. Blacksmith at the California African American Museum, and The Riddle Effect at Craft Contemporary. Hi, thank you. I'm, uh, let me share my screen here. Desktop. Um, maybe. So, um, wow. So I had COVID uh, uh, in Europe when I was working in January um, of 2020 and came home and recovered. And when I recovered, the world shut down. Um, and then this was sort of the situation that everybody found themselves in, waiting in long lines to get into the grocery store. That's Trader Joe's in Culver City. Like Rebecca, I spend a lot of time with my plants in my garden, um, sort of fretting about my children who lived in Europe and my child who lives here and whether or not I was going to be able to get them home or get to them. Um, and we were outside. Um, after George Floyd's murder uh, and the protest that followed, the police shot out my windows of my gallery, um, trying to disperse the crowds the first night of protests. And so I literally went dark. Um, and I stayed with the windows uh, boarded up until December. It was my way of adding my voice to the protest. 
Um, because I have neither uh, a husband who can support me nor an active trust fund to tip tap into and I have to work every day, I um, got support from um, the people that I do work for, including Mel Edwards. He is an artist that began here in Los Angeles at um, uh, USC. He got his MFA and um, lives in New York, but I work for him um, and we figured out how to work even more remotely and digitally, virtually. Um, and he helped me sustain my children through the year by paying me my full salary, even when I wasn't able to work. Um, after the George Floyd murder and the ensuing protests, uh, the Getty, who I also work for, asked me to create an exhibition, which um, they knew I would take very seriously in terms of illuminating how they have ignored black and brown artists forever. Um, and so I created PhotoFlux, which was supposed to open August 25th. It opens May 25th. Um, this is a Ken Gonzalez Day photograph. It's eight, eight feet tall. Um, I also curated a show called Mojo Rising at Cal State LA that I agreed to do, even though I didn't really want to, which was promised um, to be able to have visitors by appointment. Uh, but what they really wanted is my relationship to Betty Saar. Um, and this was a show about how Betty um, influenced two generations of artists in LA. This work is by Carrie James Marshall. So I did the show, we installed it. This is uh, Mojo Eyes, a close up of Med Mojo Eyes by Betty. And then, um, and then no one saw it. But uh, this, is, this is August and this is um, a large installation that's been a piece that was Betty's, part of Betty's furnace. This piece was shown for the first time in an installation at the California African American Museum in 1994 and had not been shown since. Um, and I pulled it off of her porch and dusted it off and collected all of the plant matter that she asked me to get um, for it. And again, no one saw it in real life. Um, it was a lot of work. Uh, this was a Keiko Fuzukawa uh, installation in that show. And you can imagine the time that it took and the care and the love of the work and the artists. Um, I think there were 30 artists in that exhibition. Um, and so this is what COVID has done. Um, in I don't even remember the date, November maybe, October, October 30th is opened. Uh, Glenn Wilson at Very Small Fires. I curated um, his show called Slim Margins. And one of the interesting things about COVID was for me, is for me that, you know, my focus is always on artists and building community. And I was able to maintain my friendships and relationships with um, artists with my core group of artists throughout the pandemic. Uh, so we did a lot of work together, sometimes culminating in exhibitions, sometimes just sitting, you know, six, eight feet apart in the garden, um, sometimes hours spent on the phone, looking at images, talking, laughing, doing whatever we could to just feel normal. But it was a really a privilege and a pleasure to curate this show at the end of October that um, when galleries started started doing by appointments uh, in a much more rigorous way. This is another piece in the exhibition. That's my favorite piece of Glenn's. Um, I joined the NOAA Purifoy board, which was interesting because for a long time the board um, surprisingly did not have representation of um, 
black artists, curators, collectors, um, for the most part. Uh, it was sustained by people that were friends with Noah and had deep pockets. And they realized, I think, that at some point that the board needed to reflect people who have um, not necessarily deep pockets, but a commitment to the community and to Noah's vision and voice. And so I was asked to join the board, which makes me very, very happy. Haven't been out there since I joined the board, but I have lots of pictures of my children growing up in LA and taking trips to out to the museum in Joshua Tree. Um, so I also started going to see artists in their studios when it felt, I don't know when that was, but when it felt like we could socially distance and be safe. And that inspired me to create a new exhibition in my own space, even though I had shuttered. So in December, I took the boards off my windows and gave them to um, some beautiful people in Skid Row to build a house with. And I cur curated a show called In Color with seven um, local artists. Those big pieces are Miguel Osuna, Joe Davidson, Eva Grigorva, whose name I always pronounce wrong, David Lloyd, that's a Umar Rashid back there. Um, Rosalind Miles. And one of the things that I did do also during, um, during the pandemic was I realized I'm not really a gallerist. I've never really been a gallerist. I've always had the, I've had this space for four years, but I am really a project space. So I closed Quotidian as a commercial gallery and reopened as um, the nonprofit I started in 2006, Transformative Arts. So now I'm much more sort of authentic to myself, true to my own vision. Um, and Deb Cloudman Mann of Cloudman Mann Gallery closed her gallery in Culver City and came to be in partnership with me um, to sort of take on the gallery's parts of the project that I really suck at, like selling artwork um, and sort of maintaining systems and order that I also suck at. Um, and it's a really great partnership in that way. So in January, uh, I got COVID again, um, the second time, uh, nearly 12 months after I got it the first time, just a few weeks shy of 12 months, which put, um, me into a small and still, um, I don't know what the, how to say it, a, a crisis as it were, you know, you can't, you're isolated, you're completely isolated. Um, I was lucky enough to have a nurse call me every day and check my vitals uh, and look at me and tell me when to get up and when not to get up and what my temperature was and how to check my um, oxygen flow and um, luckily, my children and I, I sent two of them because they had managed to come home from Europe um, away and that one got it, the other two didn't. Uh, and, um, oh, that's a crappy picture. But um, friends, colleagues started to um, help try to support me and because I have to work all the time every day every month to make ends meet and to keep the project open. Um, and a friend, a collector and supporter um, connected me with the Kamoinga uh, photography group and um, I'm now consulting with some of those artists. Jill, just letting you uh, know we're at ten, 10 and a half minutes. Me? I, at 10 minutes? Yeah. yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay, Kyung Mi Shin, an artist I work with. I got to when I came out of it, I went to start visiting studios again. That's June. I wrote an essay for her upcoming show. We started doing public projects. That's is Inglewood. This is East LA. Um, like Rebecca, I, I, well, I never really healed from COVID and they found a mass in my stomach and I, in March, um, went in for surgery. 
um, and then came out and went right back to work. This is the install of um, photo flux and started back to public programming in my space and then just finished uh, and opened Umar Rashid's COLA project. That's Isabel Luderat, the head of Barnstall, where the COLA show would have been um, if not for the pandemic, and Umar Rashid, the artist. And that's me. That's That was my year of COVID. Thank you, Jill. That's an uh, amazing array of exhibitions that you've done. Very busy, very impressive. Um, so next we have Kim Garrison. Uh, I'll introduce Kim. Kim is a conceptual artist, writer, musician with a love of nature, mythology, philosophy, culture, anthropology, and earth sciences. Um, she's faculty in the Orange Coast College Art Department and collaborates with Stephen Rodosevich under the name United Catalyst and co-directs an artist residency in, in the Southern Nevada desert called Mystery Rants. Um, I had the first time of working with her as a curator for a show called Stargazers Contemporary Art and Astronomy. Uh, it was a project she did with Steve Rudosevich um, called the Skywheel Project um, that's inviting people around the world to share their personal prayers for the future of the planet. And then they'll be sent up in a space satellite um, that will house these prayers. Um, and when launched, will pass over every place on Earth in a regular cycle for thousands of years. Um, so Kim Garrison. Thanks, Tyler. So I'm glad you brought up the Skywheel project because that was a life that Steve and I had before we uh, faced a pandemic. And uh, life's looked a little bit different since then uh, from thinking about things in global and long scale, large scale terms. Uh, it's taken us back to thinking locally and seeing what kinds of change we can enact in our own small scale. And uh, for us, as well as my husband, Leland Means, who is a sculptor and instructor, and uh, a few other artists who are also caretakers uh, with us of Mystery Ranch, um, this small scale means our public lands in Southern Nevada. And uh, as you can see, it's a very beautiful place. Um, and we've been exceptionally lucky during the pandemic to be able to go out there uh, and spend time in the desert and in nature and uh, being affected by our land where we can have some space to process all of this stuff that's happening to all of us. And while over the years we've spent uh, a lot of work collaborating with many other artists on their projects and also uh, researchers and scientists uh, studying the Mojave Desert environment, uh, for the most part, this last year has been about finishing projects of our own and uh, and shoring up our protections for our buildings and the ranch itself. Uh, we finished work on our camera obscura house, which is a tiny house that is also a working camera obscura that artists and researchers can stay in. And we've been able to use that and our pump house bar tiny house to continue to house people throughout the year with social distancing. Um, so during some of the times when the pandemic was not so bad, we were able to get people out there. Um, then at the beginning of this year, I was approached by the organizers of a proposal for a new national monument in Southern Nevada in the public lands that are immediately adjacent to the Mystery Ranch. And I was asked by the organizers to be the grassroots organizer for our local town of Searchlight, which would essentially be surrounded by this new national monument. And uh, our local town is a place very dear to my heart. Uh, my grandparents uh, are the 
original owners of the Mystery Ranch, and I have spent my whole life uh, there as a part of that community and uh, interacting with that landscape. So um, I said yes to being a grassroots organizer and also a, an artist colleague uh, and curator in Southern Nevada, uh, Checo Salgado, asked if uh, he could partner with us at the Mystery Ranch in curating an arts exhibition that uh, helped to support this uh, national monument proposal and help tell the public about the beauty of these lands. So um, one of the biggest issues for us, um, as you can see by this map, is that about three decades has gone into all of these wonderful colorful areas uh, in Southern Nevada and Arizona and California. Those all represent National Park Service land or wilderness area or other protected uh, landscape. And then this blue area is the proposed national monument. And these plain areas within the blue are little pocket areas that are not protected land. And what has been happening in the last 15 years is that um, with our quest for uh, green energy, um, various large scale industrial energy projects have been proposed for these areas, which would essentially then uh, really damage all of this protected landscape around it once uh, 800 foot high uh, industrial wind farms, for instance, uh, could go across this entire mountain range and be seen from three states because they're so large. So it's been a really interesting position as an artist and curator to be asked outright to become an activist, even though my work with Steve and United Catalysts, even the name United Catalysts implies that we're interested in being a part of a, a dialogue of, uh, of society and community and transformation. Um, so I've spent some of this year um, uh, bravely becoming part of a, a conservation uh, group effort with many organizations with the help of my husband Leland as well uh, and um, and stepping up our work at Mystery Ranch so that we invite artists out there to uh, interpret the land for them and uh, what's been working me out of this is the fact that artists are good activists because we're trained to observe the world around us in detail and as a system. And we spend time interpreting the stories of that world or environment that we're looking at. And we're trained to present them to an audience. So um, this year is about using those skills. Uh, for instance, um, as we come out of the pandemic uh, this summer, um, we will be uh, presenting a new exhibit called Postcards from the East Mojave at the Searchlight Community Center. So uh, uh, that is a very small community venue that's never seen an art show before. Searchlight has about 400 permanent residents, so it's a very small town. And uh, both professional artists from around the world who've been part of Mystery Ranch and uh, local people and school children and anyone who's involved in the area can participate in this exhibition. Uh, and so we're pretty excited about working in a small capacity with our small community and seeing how much that is able to change uh, this town's perception of itself uh, and highlight the beauty of our public lands around it. And one of the things that we've come up against throughout our 
couple decades of getting people out to the Mystery Ranch, and especially now, is this mythology of the desert as being a wasteland. And this mythology especially holds true with Nevada for some reason. For some reason, let me go back. Uh, um, Nevada is perceived as being a place of emptiness and a place where there are a lot of natural resources for us to exploit and space where we can put things that we would rather not see. Um, where we can kind of sweep under the rug the fact that uh, California uh, is using more energy than it's making so um, it can put big energy projects in another state uh, and then consume that energy. So um, okay, I'm just letting you know we're at nine minutes. Okay, so our, um, our public lands are a bit of a battleground. And um, because of COVID, um, our art practices have changed. And what the last thing that's working me is that interaction of any kind can be part of our art practices. Um, we might be used to working with art institutions, but our interactions on social media, um, in our own homes and in our backyards are all a part of how we as creative people can develop our practice. And I wanted to leave you with um, an Instagram post from the Mystery Ranch recently. Why do we go to the desert? To see the land, the sky, the vastness, and to breathe in and out in the space, and to think more quietly, more humbly, to experience time and being outside of time, and appreciate my life and your life and all life in its struggles and bloomings, fleeting and everlasting, is both transient and part of something greater. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Um, that was great. It's interesting to, it's always interesting to hear. I'm living here by the ocean. Ocean desert are often seen as these wastelands. <laughs> how we look at the geography. Okay, um, so next we have Samantha Fields and um, Rebecca is gonna introduce Samantha. Samantha is a good friend and a fantastic artist. Uh, Samantha Fields landscape paintings depict dramatic weather systems in which exaggerated use of light and shadow creates psychologically charged, even apocalyptic visions. Her images are drawn from photographs taken while chasing storm cells across the US an experience she describes as essential to her own work. I'll also add, she is an incredible academic, a brilliant teacher, and her new work is actually dealing directly with what we've all been through, uh, but she's been dealing with it for some years, this idea of the apocalypse and systems disintegrating. Sam. Thank you, Rebecca, for that. And thank you everybody for these incredible talks. I've really enjoyed listening to them so far. Um, you guys can see this, right? Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna start with an essay that I wrote right after LA went on lockdown last year. For the How Are You Project by Nicole Walker, who's a friend of Rebecca's, participants were asked to answer this simple prompt. I wrote this several weeks into the LA lockdown. How am I? Every night, just after sunset, a rat runs down the power line that connects my studio to our house. The first time I saw it, I yelled, rat, rat. Now I look forward to seeing him. He's so fast, running along the wire, a tightrope walker, unafraid, no net. If he doesn't show up, I worry a little. I add it to the rest. Some days I paint. I'm a painter making paintings that may or may not be seen. A tree falling in the woods? Is it art if nobody sees it? I'm being hyperbolic. I see them. Andre sees them. We count. I keep making, but my making is sporadic. It feels like a furlough when I paint, a temporary reprieve where I can fall into familiar rhythms. I need more ultramarine blue. Put it on the list. I'm a professor, California State University, Northridge. Since March, I've been on a panic-driven curricular triage. Now the term is over, but Zoom meetings persist. We must plan for fall. People on the internet exclaim, I have so much time now. I'm bored. Here's my banana bread, and I am envious. 
I seem to have so much time and also no time at all. How is that possible? How is any of this possible? I have what is called the disaster mindset. My paintings are about the end of the world. Wait, no, they're about the end of us. The world soldiers on, we are not the world. In the past, I carefully painted the people out of my landscapes. Sometimes there would be a hint of us, a house with a light on or an empty road. Then I painted tiny people in Exodus out of my work and out of the world. Now they are back and the landscape is gone. Crowds of people, spring breakers, tiny MAGA hats on tiny empty heads. We live in earthquake country, so we always have a well-stocked pantry. It's never if, always when. But this isn't the disaster I was preparing for. It looks different. It looks like us. It is us. I'm adjusting to this new world, and I'm thinking about the future. It's a high wire act, and I'm the rat. So for the past 15 years, my work has dealt with disaster, personal, political, and environmental. I'm going to briefly give you a little pandemic and review and talk about how this disaster has influenced my teaching and my practice. The crowds that I painted during lockdown were atypical for me. I'm better known for making landscape paintings about severe weather and fires. In fact, all of my firework opened at the California Museum of Photography two weeks before the lockdown. Um, it's all still there, and hopefully this will reopen soon and people can see the show. Of course, in California, we're all familiar with fires, uh, but this COVID disaster was different. At first, I didn't know how to depict it. The scariest thing was being shoulder to shoulder with strangers, so I kind of cathartically painted what we were all afraid of. And I ended up showing this work online last year with Cole Case at Another Year in LA, a show I didn't expect to do or have. Another big project that came from the pandemic was the SIP ARP residency. It's the self-isolation artists, the self-isolation pandemic artist residency program. I created this program for my students when we moved online. I reformated the class as an asynchronous residency program and built this website to document, which you are welcome to visit. I'll put it in the chat later. There's a ton of student work and um, pandemic studios documented on the site. And for this project, I basically gave everyone a simple action plan. The idea was to reframe the lockdown and create a narrative for students that allowed them some space, both mentally and physically, to make their work. So I basically threw away my syllabus and this is what we did. Of course, graduation was canceled, so we had our own. And no semester is ever complete without a class photo. I didn't have my regalia, so I dressed like a tree and the I had a Christmas tree outfit and the students all constructed their own regalia. I formalized the residency with certificates of participation and I make a new one each semester. So, you know, I only planned to do this residency for two weeks um, and here we are a full two semesters later. My own studio transformed a lot as well during the pandemic. At first, I moved downstairs to my storage room. The small space was more comfortable. And yes, I took a lot of naps under that table. I would just crawl under there when I was traumatized. I also had to figure out a way to teach technical painting online. So this was solution number one. This is in my main studio. And then eventually I found a version that worked much better. So my basic structure was, I'm gonna to try to play this. Um, I demo techniques on Tuesdays, and then on Thursday, we'd all paint together in Zoom. So I was really channeling my inner Bob Ross um, during this time. Hold on, I lost my stuff. Now I have a second screen, which you see me looking at all the time when other people are talking. So I can see what I'm doing and see my students. So I feel like I'm making some progress. Even before the pandemic, I always ask my students what they want to do in class. Like we have a conversation about what the semester will be like. And during the pandemic, we all know that pets have been a great comfort. So they requested a day of pet painting and they got a day of pet painting. So there's my cat Maggie. I never thought I would do something like this in class, but it was a lot of fun. I even came to class one day dressed as a banana. I learned how to use um, Snapchat. You know, and when you're teaching online all the time, you have got to figure out a way to mix it up. I even dragged everything outside to do plain, air, plain April with my students. I teach a representational painting class and I like dragged all my technology and paints and everything and we still painted out doors together, which is a tradition we have and I was glad to be able to uphold it. So, you know, teaching on online, as you can see from those images, it takes an enormous amount of time but I still managed to have a solo show at LSH in June called American Dreams. And we even had a socially distanced art opening. 
This work was made over the span of the Trump presidency and dealt with a collapsing nation. Like I mentioned, my work deals with all forms of disaster, and in reality, the personal, environmental, and political aspects of disaster always intersect. In this work, I was combining various disasters with signs of celebration as a way to comment on a nation divided. And we are deeply divided. One side celebrates and the other revolts. This pendulum continues to swing back and forth with no end in sight. The title referred to the American dream, the myth that everyone desperately wants to believe in. A home, a life, a job, some happiness. But dreams aren't real, and we awake to a world, and we must reckon with it. So for me, um, Safer at Home involved using a spotting scope to shoot video from my backyard. Um, this is one of those odd pandemic projects that probably would not have happened outside of lockdown as I typically travel to gather my source materials. But for the last year, I've had to remain stationary looking outward. I also use the scope to document fires. So this was a fire that happened over the summer. And to conclude, I wanted to share a bit of what I'm doing right now. I'm known for paintings of disasters, huge towering clouds, but clouds have silver linings. So I've been going through my archive of images from the last year, and I've been looking for the bright spots. So this is a painting of my niece, Ella, night swimming in Palm Springs. Getting to see my family again was probably the biggest bright spot of the pandemic because um, everyone I'm related to lives far away from me. Um, it was risky, but it was the greatest risk that I took and the happiest. And the other bright spot was being able to see my students again. So I will be retiring the SIP Art Residency this fall as we return to campus. And I also have coming up a show opening tomorrow, which is why the wall is set up the way it is behind me today. Um, I have a show opening with an online with Arcade Project in New York, um, curated by M. Charlene Stevens and Kim Light. And we will be doing an artist talk tomorrow as well. So I'll put a link in the chat if you would like to join us. And I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Samantha. Um, that was enlightening, <laughs> especially interesting to see the telescope um, as a source. Um, uh, so next we have, um, our, and our last panelist is Chris Christian. And uh, Chris um, is now based in Sacramento, wears many hats as both an artist and a curator, like a lot of us do, which I think uh, has made the panel really fascinating. Uh, so once again, uh, Rebecca is going to introduce Chris. Chris Christian has a hybrid of experiences as an artist, curator, educator, and arts administrator. He work, his work explores themes of history, identity, religion, and inherited social perceptions. He's exhibited throughout the US and Europe, and his work also appears in the critically acclaimed 2005 feature film, Me, You, and Everyone We Know. I'm particularly interested in, I've been watching his social media and the interesting turns his personal work has taken this year. So I'm excited to hear his contributions to the discussion. Okay. Um, oh, one second, sorry. Okay. All right, my PowerPoint wasn't coming up. So, um, as I said, my name is Chris Christian. I graduated um, uh, my um, undergrad for painting and then went on to studio arts at Irvine. And in the process, I developed this practice of um, working both as an artist, curator, educator, and um, administrator. And um, through all that, I was introduced uh, by my wife to the work of Audre Lorde, and particularly biomethography and the idea of kind of blending um, myth and history and personal mythography, um, mythology. Um, and this literary term and how and thinking about how it could be applied to an art practice, we developed this um, curatorial project um, known as biomethography and developed it considering kind of um, 
how these ideas could work in a, a studio practice and in a curatorial practice. And so we, we started um, producing a number of shows under the umbrella of biomethography um, and then um, tying that to these classes and workshops, working directly with um, um, classes and students and doing panels and talks and um, different programming. And through that, um, I was trying to consider how that could kind of develop into uh, um, a curriculum. And we recently moved. Um, we moved to um, Sacramento about two years ago. And I had the opportunity to um, teach a class at UC Berkeley. And I started kind of incorporating ideas of biomethography in my painting and drawing classes, um, particularly using a, um, a workshop that we did on uh, this iceberg activity, which introduces kind of students to the idea of um, how, how different ways they can look at identity and more importantly, the idea that there are these multi multiple dimensions to an individual identity. Um, through that, um, I was incorporating those again in my painting and drawing classes, but um, I got the opportunity um, to create a class um, around these ideas um, for incoming freshmen. And so I, do, I created this class um, specific to biomethography as a practice. Um, and the challenge was creating a class that was online, that was um, a studio class for non-artists and dealing kind of with some of the issues that were happening um, today. So um, kind of combining the ideas of biomethography and notions of visual literacy, I developed this um, curriculum around um, the idea of visual journaling which I explained to them visual journaling was similar to a sketchbook, but not. Um, and it was a way to kind of um, let them understand that the process of drawing wasn't just about um, technical skills, but about really kind of um, processing your thoughts and visual communications. So ideas of words being important in mixed media and um, it being personally meaningful were worked in. And, um, kind of with that, the class kind of developed through conversations and um, kind of tapping into, you know, what was going on in their world, what they were looking for. So um, it kind of grew and developed with, the, um, with each class. And I started showing them images of my own sketchbook and um, from years ago at undergrad and how these works over time ended up developing into actual works. Um, and so what we ended up doing was um, tying to class, the end of the class and the final, to the idea of developing um, a, a proposal for a public project. So they'd have to consider kind of um, their personal needs, their personal identity, the identity of the community that um, select the kind of location, kind of what the needs of the location was, what message they wanted to put out to the um, to the audience who was receiving it, what materials would be used, what kind of um, kind of color palette would they use, and all the things that can um, affect the read of a, a of a public piece, and kind of get to how you visually kind of get across the ideas that they were kind of struggling with in, in terms of how they go through the time themselves. Um, and I'm going to go through this kind of fast, but um, some of the changes uh, um, that occurred in my personal practice as a result of kind of developing that class and also in moving was that I originally was working on um, this kind of art project process that um, dealt with a lot of interactive work. So 
um, these masks in which you had this kind of um, personal experience between the mask and the, the visuals going on in these videos, um, which required you to kind of get behind the mask. And um, during this time of COVID, the idea of creating this interactive work um, became kind of problematic. So I myself was kind of rethinking my practice and then I had also been in a place where I, when we moved, I had one way more time in this time um, of working online and living kind of um, inside. So I had way more time on my hands um, and I had space, which we hadn't had. Um, we had gotten this space, we um, been able to get this space that had this beautiful upstairs attic that we've turned into the studio space. And so in consideration of my work that I've been developing over kind of all these years that I'd never quite gotten to show all of it, I started kind of building this internal space within that space um, as a display area um, to just be able to kind of get the work out there, get the ideas out there and process them and and get them with the kind of urgency that I was feeling in the making of them. Um, so I created this um, with my wife, we created this space called the Church of Biomethography, um, which is this um, idea of this multimedia space in which we could do both kind of um, installations, do kind of recordings. Um, at the time, we'd been working on um, a curatorial project for the Wignall Museum. So we started doing um, a recording of our own process and um, interviewing um, each other through um, um, using this space and other spaces in our house. So really trying to kind of make the most of the space that we lived in. And so I've been kind of running these um, different spaces and it allows me to quickly kind of document the work. And I've been using Instagram to just um, put the work out um, kind of in, with the immediacy that it comes with it. And um, in addition to that, um, having this time and space I've, and also working with uh, students with drawing and painting, I've been um, really working on my own um, painting and drawing process because, you know, and teaching it, it always kind of brings you back to the basics. And um, I also have this challenge with my students to kind of push themselves past what they already know um in terms of their own practice or however they make work so i've been challenging myself to do that with them so i'll work along with them um in the same space of discomfort as they work in so that i can kind of um give them no excuses for you know pushing their own practice so lately i've been making um the series of work um in which I'm taking these um, little toys and characters from my own history and past, and in some cases, um, new characters of these black figures that, um, and toys and representations that I played with, and finding these images of them kind of dismantled um, or apart, very interesting. I also picked up- um, again, Chris, just letting you know we're at 10 and a half minutes. Okay, um, my painting practice in which I kind of pushed again the ideas of what I was doing. And unfortunately, I didn't have um, the kind of process images, but um, just to show you, I've been, it developed in this whole series, um, kind of that push of works recently of my own family, as I've been thinking about this time of COVID and the fact that we actually don't have many um, photos of my own family. Um, I've been doing this series in which I've been kind of playing with my own process. So none of these are done, but I'm, they're just in process of really pushing my own practice and um, use of these images of um, family um, that are very um, kind of, in some cases, um, fuzzy and um, deteriorating, but it's 
this kind of interesting process of bringing back these images that exist mostly in my mind um, and in these kind of fuzzy pictures. I think. Um, lastly, I've been um, reintroducing um, myself to this project that I had done in 2014, which was um, doing these drawings in relationship to kind of the the um, damage that we see and the care that we take for um, sculptures that we um, see in museums and take such great care of, and the lack of um, kind of care that we take on the actual human beings that um, we see throughout the day. So um, this one um, in particular was done, um, interesting enough, from the bust that was damaged of Breonna Taylor. And um, this is the last image I have, and I'm just working on kind of all these different um, bodies of work at the same time with no time schedule, which is really a new place for me. Thank you, Chris. Or, thank you, Chris. Um, a really powerful work. Um, so I think um, uh, I, ha I have some questions I can start off with. And if anybody wants to put anything in the chat, but I, I think just, uh, I think some of the things in listening to all the panelists, if I had to kind of pick up on some patterns of thought, it feels like, you know, there's a lot of discussion of blurring life and art, you know, maybe during this time of COVID has provided a lot of moments, you know, self-reflection. I think like, uh, uh, Chris, you know, talked about, I think there was a lot of response um, in the chat with the biomythography, you know, concept. People were saying, wow, really amazing concept. And I think this idea of the stories we tell ourselves or the visible and invisible aspects of our identities that Chris talked about. Um, but I, I, so one question I wanted to start off with is maybe coming back around to Jill and Rebecca, um, you know, um, and maybe starting with Jill, since you had two bouts of COVID, which is amazing. You're the first person I think I know who's had that experience. But I was wondering if maybe you could uh, elucidate a little bit more, if any thoughts that you might've had during that time as reflective on your own practice or did your practice change during that time or were you just really focused on healing um, and couldn't think about anything else? Um, I mean, honestly, I thought, oh my God, I have, you know, I didn't get the good memo in school of like how you save money and how you work and you, you know, focus on your own security first. You know, I have always done work where I'm trying to support community and, um, and I mostly thought, oh shit, because I have, I have sacrificed my own sense of security and my kids uh, security so that I could be engaged in the work that I was doing. So I started making long lists for them of who could help them should I succumb, which was very stressful. Um, they have no relationship with their family or my family, their dad's family or my family. So I was, you know, it, it actually made me very clear on who that community I had built was really my friend and who were artists that I knew that I thought were my friends, but really weren't. So in that way, it definitely shifted um, how I conceived of what it is that I do and who I understand uh, is, you know, connected to me through more than just wanting to be in one of my exhibitions or wanting me to do a studio visit with them. But, you know, people who are really um, know me and are for me as I am for them. Yeah, and I think that came through in your presentation, especially when you talked about the community of artists that you kind of continued to work with and dialogue, you know, during that time. Um, Rebecca, what, what about you? Uh, for me, so I had, I did have COVID. I, I, I luckily had, you know, relatively, it was still bad, but it was a relatively mild case, but I, my health was at question for the last year. Um, and for me, you know, I have always felt myself syncopated with the art world, um, in terms of my upbringing was, was, 
uh, it just it was what it was. We weren't allowed to listen to rock and roll, but we were taken to the symphony. We had this very kind of particular upbringing that made me feel uh, quite naive when I entered the art world. You know, I didn't understand influence, all of that other stuff. So I spent a long time trying to justify my presence in the art world in a weird way. You know, I went to a very rigorous university where it was important you could articulate yourself well, you could place yourself in art history, all of that other stuff, which has been very useful to me. But there was a kind of, um, kind of assumption that the kind of, uh, honestly, just autobiographical tendencies that I have, kind of diary-like presentation even I gave today was not kosher. And um, when you're faced with your mortality, uh, it doesn't, you just stop giving a shit about that. And the business evaporates. And so for me, it really turned, you know, I mean, I just made an enormous painting of a kid in a beautiful forest with a t-shirt that says love on it. I mean, that's extreme, it's difficult to justify in a super academic kind of environment. But for me, I really fell even further away from um, ideas about what I should be making or I'm supposed to be making or how other people will respond to it. Because it's honestly, I mean, my first move to the art world was from religion. And it was a kind of desperate um, at trying to save myself from what I felt like would be a, a very miserable life. And so I have that same return that I feel like it's selfish. But my first impulse to make is to sort out what this is this whole, what we're doing here, how we survive. I mean, what we have all been asked to hold the last year is sort of incomprehensible. But one thing my mother told me when I was little, we had had a particularly uh, terrifying fireside at the church in which they were telling us about the end of the world and the apocalypse. And so I couldn't sleep. And I was sort of sitting at the bottom of her bed and, and she took me into her arms uh, and she said, sweetheart, it has always been the end of the world. And she was trying to comfort me. She said, when your grandma was little, it was the end of the world. When I was a girl, it was the end of the world. And she was trying to say that we each have these enormous things to hold and deal with. And that's the important stuff. So for me, unfortunately, it almost always takes a, a horrible event or a crisis to reorient people, um, uh, myself included, because you, you, know, you, you stray, you start thinking about things that are easier to think about than your mortality or your children's mortality or your inability to control your health or your inability to control the political landscape. The picture of my kids, you know, when they were talking about it looking like Tatooine, they knew that it wasn't supposed to look like Tatooine. The earth is not supposed to look like that. And so I did a kind of thing like my mother would do. I didn't pivot. We went straight into talking about environmental collapse. And we talked about the sublime. And we talked about the sublime being a, a, a connection between the terrifying and the magnificent. And they got it, you know? They got it. They're 9, 11, and 13, and they're right there with us. Maybe on maybe on that note, um, maybe Samantha, if you could pick up on that <laughs> and the terror and sublime, and um, since you've been engaged with it and continue to be, um, even through a voyeurist or not voyeuristic, but your uh, uh, your your telescope that uh, in the chat, people were very fascinated by. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because we're Kim and I are in the chat. We were talking a little bit about gardening, and I, I garden too. I've been gardening since I was a kid. Um, my family we we farmed some land with a couple other families and my grandparents when I was young. And just being able to have some outdoor space to kind of situate myself in 
um, and looking through that scope. So I really felt like I was like really confined to the space, but I had the scope that extended my vision out like far beyond my own physical location. And that to me became a really interesting concept as well. And of course the sublime, you know, it's some of the ideas I think about go all the way back you know, like if you look at the Hudson River School, the most beautiful sunsets are pollution sunsets. They're the ones that are killing us. And so this idea of, of beauty and destruction, they kind of go hand in hand. And, you know, like Rebecca, I grew up um, in a very religious family. And I, you know, I, I'll probably be talking about this tomorrow as well. You know, I grew up um, learning to read through the book of Revelation, <laughs> you know, and so it's like those, that lens of, of seeing the world, it's, it's formed so early, you know, but the thing was, I was terrified by the book of Revelation, but the language was so poetic, you know, so this beauty, like, and terror, to me, they, they've always seemed to kind of somehow connect. Um, and it's like, you can use beauty as a lure to bring people in to have the conversations you want them to have. Right. You know, that's a big part of it. Well, and then it's, yeah, in terms of converse, you know, creating conversations and connections with the community, I wanted to, you know, I was struck with Chris and Kim, as being um, artists, you know, I guess sort of primarily, and then that kind of leading into, um, you know, creating project spaces or, um, you know, a pedagogical practice, you know, for um, extending their own research within their artwork, you know, um, to other people. Um, so, Chris, maybe I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more. I'm not sure if I understood clearly on the Church of the Biomythography, if that's just for your own work or if that's an installation, so to speak, or if it's something that other people can kind of enter into. Um, and if not, maybe you can expand on the idea of kind of creating space to work with other people in the community. Yeah, you know, originally it started out actually um, in my head as it would be cool to have this space um, to do my installation in. Um, and then through conversations with my wife, we talked about the idea of this space can function um, as this multi-space for um, other installations, for um, interviews with other artists. So um, since we've been in a pandemic, <laughs> we haven't been able to do any of that, but um, the idea kind of um, was to develop it into this kind of um, multi-use space um, for interacting in different ways with art and artists. And is that at your your home or your studio or? It's in our home. And, okay. Um, yeah, it's our kind of home slash studio. Right. Um, yeah, and that I and so Kim, you know, in the same way you've kind of created with the Mystery Ranch, which is even though you don't live there um, full time, um, you know, it is connected to uh, you know a, a house. And everything, but maybe if you could talk a little bit about um, inviting people out to the Mystery Ranch. Well, um, you know, this pandemic for me is a lot about humbleness. And uh, another thing that humbled me in my life was when I inherited that 60 acres from my grandparents. And uh, no one else in my family was around at the time to uh to help me take care of it uh so i realized immediately that i i am just the caretaker of this land and also i can't do it on my own i can't uh exist with that land i can't protect it and i can't enjoy it because it's too big a project for me so right away um it needed other people to exist uh and to keep it safe and and do its work and so um i've just been listening to what it wants since then and what it wants is to tell people stories about the mojave desert and get people out of their experience in the city so that they can experience stillness and space and uh some breathing room from uh our built environment that we humans love to uh, control and and experience nature being in control and us being you know polite neighbors uh, trying not to piss off our other neighbors uh, and so um, uh, you know that's evolved over the years um, as pretty steadily from something informal to something formal and by that mean I, we have 
a website so you can be an official artist in residence. And I think there are actually a few Mystery Ranch artists here today. Uh, and, uh, and then now it's evolved into something else by being formally asked to participate in art ventures. Um, but I, I think what excites me the most is getting artists and educators and students interacting uh, with scientists and conservationists and, uh, and historians and just having that mix um, in a region that mythologically, um, like Chris is working on, that those stories we tell ourselves about uh, ourselves and our place in the world, um, the desert is this place that needs a reshaping of its stories. So uh, if we can help you know, the, the art community and the science community and, uh, and regular people uh, shift their perceptions a little bit, then we're helping that place continue to exist. And I have um, one more question, and if you guys want to interact, um, it's if, for Jill. I, Jill, I was really curious about the, um, when you talk about um, the space in um, LA and how, you know, the windows were shot out during the protests and you decided to leave it up and then, um, you know, later, you know, and then you later transformed it. But I, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that experience of recognizing you know, what was a result of protests and then you deciding to leave it as a symbolic, you know, as your own, you know, um, symbolic um, contribution and just your thoughts going through that in terms of how a space, you know, gets transformed, you know. Um. Um, well, it was interesting because my, uh, the protests were obviously in downtown. I'm not that far from City Hall where a lot of them were, start at least began and then they would march um, down up down across Spring Street but um, because I am not a young person anymore I and because I had COVID and I was uh, getting better it took me a very long time the first time to recover from COVID um, I didn't feel necessarily safe in being out in the street with those protests so it was just my act of solidarity. I have three black children, sons, boys, men, whatever they are at various moments of the day, um, uh, all in their 20s. And you know, I have worked very hard to get them out of this country um, because of the multiple interactions they've had with the police at gunpoint. Um, and uh, and so you know, this was a I guess a reckoning for some people, but this is nothing unusual. Like, you know, really the murder of George Floyd, but it was a beautiful thing to see people finally sort of wake up to what the US experiment is because that experiment in democracy is based on the subjugation and oppression um, of black life. And so having big black boards across my windows of a space that I feel is very much about welcoming anyone off the street, it's a storefront, old bank building, um, to close it off and to leave black boards there was a way that I could say very clearly who I was and what my thoughts on it were. It was very interesting, everyone boarded up after that first night and everyone was tagged in my whole neighborhood except mine. Mine remained pristine until December when I took them down. And I think it's because um, I am very active and visible in this community and people understood what that statement meant. Oh, thank you, Jill. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, and I, it makes me think when you mention the different ways we're connected to community. I know with Kim, you know, um, just as, an, as a, like in the desert where everybody's sparse and there's no infrastructure, everybody is dependent on each other to take care of one another. You really have to learn <laughs> to, re to really connect with your neighbors uh, in order to um, have them look out for you and you look out for them and to kind of really survive, um, you know, when the situation can get harsh. Um, so did, did you guys have any questions for each other? We've definitely, you know, we've gone way over, but it's been such a fascinating conversation. Most of our audience is still with us, um, but 
I don't know if you had, got, had questions or anybody else had questions or if we're just exhausted. <laughs> I feel like it's maybe a longer conversation okay. for a different time, but I, I've had a really wonderful time. I think finding ways of connecting to other artists and seeing the kind of amazing transformation that's happened for many people. I mean, I sounds very Pollyannish, but I, it gives me so much hope moving forward in terms of where I feel like the people I know are who are in the art world and what has, you know, how they have come out of this moment. It was very difficult, but anyway, it's wonderful to see everybody's uh, own story and it, it gives me a lot to move forward with going into what will no doubt be just as complicated a year in a different way. <laughs> Great. And thank and Rebecca, thank you for suggesting this panel and, you know, bringing everybody, um, you know, here to participate. And um, thank you to the audience. Thank you all for uh, um, being here and sticking around for the extra half hour. Um, it was really fascinating. I could just go on too, you know, and um, so I think we'll go ahead and end it here then. So, and uh, oh yes, and it was recorded and we'll, um, post a recording on the website and have it in the next newsletter. So thanks. Bye-bye. Nice.